Thank you everyone for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time to want to learn more on this particular topic of the work that we do. Uh, for Lift Orlando, it's something that's been really critical, not only in our mission and what drives the motivation of the leaders uh, in the work, but also in our communication to our commitment to the neighborhood. Uh, when we started out explaining the Purpose Built Communities model, in Purpose Built, you kind of define the broad definition of wellness to include employment and upward uh, financial mobility for folks. But for us, at first glance, you know, a lot of residents kind of poked at us. Well, that, the housing, the education, the wellness all sounds fine and dandy, but if people are making more money, aren't they still poor? <laughs> Uh, and so it's kind of really hard to argue that. And so we, had, we made a statement by adding uh, a fourth pillar to our model, and it was just a way to respond to the residents and say, we hear you. Uh, and we're not here to implant our agenda of what we're doing. We want to have shared goals that we can call shared uh, authentically and, and genuinely. Uh, and also, I think for us, the realization, we're doing very special work. If you're doing this kind of placemaking work to transform a specific neighborhood, uh, from uh, really the chronic distress of uh, generational poverty. And you realize quickly, as we did in Orlando, that there's sort of several buckets of, of nonprofits doing good work in the community. There are people doing relief, the folks feeding, clothing, housing, helping folks in crisis and immediate need. Uh, but if for folks that are stuck in chronic generational poverty, you know, that free sandwich is only going to go so far. Uh, there is a, a growing number of folks in our community doing betterment work. We are providing skills and training and giving folks tools. Uh, it's the kind of difference, uh, as we've heard described in the metaphor of going from giving a man a fish to teaching a man how to fish. Uh, this work allows us to make sure the man not only knows uh, how to fish, but uh, has a fishing rod, has the right bait, has access to a pond that's been stocked and isn't fenced off, and so some of the environmental circumstances for success. But you can do some of those larger things and then not get back to giving those skills to these folks so that they can actually rise out of poverty. And so I think I'm really excited about hearing from both of our panelists today because of what they're doing. Uh, our efforts to really advance economic viability have been moving, but we're still in the nascent stages of it. So I, I'm listening as a learner as well to identify ways in which we can not only alleviate people's experience in neighborhoods of concentrated poverty by transforming that physical environment, but actually provide an upward escalator out of poverty, where they start to create mobility uh, for themselves because they become more valuable uh, in the marketplace. And so to start off our conversation, I'm going to put each of you on the spot for a couple minutes just to introduce yourself and what you're doing, the nature of the approach that you've taken to help address this very challenge. Okay. Shauna, start with you. Sure. Um, this is on. Okay, yes. I'm Shauna Dorsey. I'm with the AIM Institute. And I'll give you a little bit of background, right, because um, I am with AIM now. I've been with them for about nine months. Mm -hmm. And we do some work with 75 North as well. Um, but prior to that, for three years, I ran a code school called Interface Web School. Mm -hmm. um, it's a part-time web developer training program. Um, we partner a lot with uh, nonprofits, or we partnered, still do. Uh, with uh, nonprofits to build applications for them and then taught people the skills, uh, these like work ready um, 21st century tech skills basically to, to get themselves out of poverty or lower yeah. income situations. Um, so we've had people go from making minimum wage to 40,000 a year in 10 weeks, um, after 10 weeks I should say. From minimum wage yeah. to over 40,000 mm -hmm. in a 10 week period of time. Right, right, right. So it's a special type of candidate that's a good fit for this and that's something that I'm interested in exploring here during this conversation mm -hmm. because we love tech, I love it. It's empowering, it's incredible, low barriers to entry, all of that, but it's not for everyone. Yeah. So it's like how do we make sure that people have access to um, wealth, not wealth building necessarily, but those advancement opportunities even outside of this space. But that's primarily what I do. Um, I now work for a nonprofit called the AIM Institute as I mentioned. I run sales and marketing for that organization. And um, AIM acquired Interface earlier this year. So I brought Interface with me to AIM. Um, we are still running it. It's growing and thriving under uh, this nonprofit structure now. And we have access to different grant sources so that people who don't necessarily have the funds to pay for tuition can get some mm. support for that. Um, and then we do placement on the back end. So it's fully training, then support for placement into these jobs that we're getting them ready for. How new is it for 75 North, and how's it going here? Yeah, so for 75 North, um, AIM has partnered with 75 North for the last three years. We've run a summer code camp for high school students, hmm. and that's gone very well. We have um, some of our some of the graduates from that graduates, if you will, have yeah. landed internships in tech and have expressed now a new interest in pursuing tech education in um, college, which is fantastic. And yeah. we're 
really targeting those lower income uh, students who might not have been aware of those opportunities prior. So That is so great. It's going well. Um, and we're looking at doing a year-round um, code school. Age range, would you say? 18 to 24 for the year-round. Uh, the summer program is for high school students yeah. only. Yep. Yeah, so perfect. Thank you. I know there's going to yeah. be a lot of questions about that. Yeah, we'll dive great. a little it's bit fun. deeper as well. Okay. Uh, Frank, I'm so happy you're here. We actually spoke over the phone. It's going to be like three or four years now. Uh, was maybe our first connect. Um, mm -hmm. yep. And I think it was through Purpose Built, through Carol or Greg or somebody. Uh, in Orlando, we really started out partly because we had this brand new football stadium, $210 million into a stadium. We don't even have a football team. Um, but it's, it's a public <laughs> venue for events that's operated by a not-for-profit that gives money uh, away to charity. But it was built, like many stadiums, in our case, in the lowest income neighborhood in our county. Uh, and so this idea that was compelling to consider, could we be a football stadium that's actually good for the neighborhood that it's in? And so it's always been a hope to see other cities contemplate doing something like that. Tell us what the Arthur Blank Foundation is doing. Sure. So um, I'm going to start with, if you don't mind, with just showing a quick video, uh, which, which will give you an overview of the, the workforce development uh, initiatives we've been uh, partnering on. So when we start there, I'll, I'll give you a little background. The vision of Westside Works is that it's changing people's lives by providing opportunity. I was actually um, in a bad situation. I was um, living in a homeless shelter and I was looking for a way out. Westside Works helped me get on my feet and get out the shelter. <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful kind of second chance, almost a rehabilitation program where without any financial um, burden on a resident, they can receive an education and be placed into a position that offers and provides a living wage. We've had so much success over the years now um, to where it's landed us here at Mercedes-Benz Stadium with West Nest. I've been employed ever since I graduated from the class. Um, I've took on different positions, but for the most part, I was able to follow my passion of cooking. Everybody in the West Side Work Program is from the West Side. So, not only is the program building up the people, but we're building up the neighborhood as well. I truly believe that uh, it's a good program. And I see the changes what's going around in the neighborhood. Blank family uh, folks came in and were talking to my students and kind of like, you know, picking their brains about what they thought about maybe the students and I running concession stand here. And they came up with this concept. It would be something specific to the West Side. I'm a Westside Works graduate, culinary arts, and this is basically our concession stand. It's not just food that students or graduates prepare, it's amazing food. We're using the best ingredients. Um, there's a lot of thought that went behind the menu. And again, the fact that the students are putting you know, their stamp on this. It's just, I personally think it's going to be a different feel. Um, I'm very happy and honored to be an employee of West Nest, you know, and then like I say, for the most part, represent West Side Works. I want our employees to exude that confidence and that gratitude and that pride that I believe everybody has in being part of West Side Works. Welcome to West Nest. So it gives you a little bit of background on, on one of the programs that we have through Westside Works, but our journey really began uh, when our chairman and founder, Arthur Blank, decided to build a new stadium. So those of you who, may, who are not, aren't from now may not know who Arthur is. Arthur co-founded Home Depot um, and now owns the Atlanta Falcons and a few other businesses in Atlanta and throughout the country. And he made a decision really about 10 years, started more than 10 years ago, that he wanted, after he had acquired the Falcons, that he wanted to build a new stadium. And so part of how Arthur operates is that he doesn't want to do it like everyone else does things, <laughs> right? And so one of the key things that he was wanting to do is how do we change the sports stadium narrative, right? In that a lot of folks complain about, well, they, they move the stadiums out of, out of downtown into the suburbs. They're these you know, dead assets only uh, open 10 times a year and they do nothing to uplift the communities around them. And so that was a key focus for us is, as you saw in the video, this, the new stadium is 80 feet away from the old stadium. So made a commitment to downtown Atlanta, even though it was a lot more expensive, a lot more headache in all honesty and brain damage, 
but he was committed to Atlanta because that's where he, he built Home Depot. This is his home. Second, really turning the narrative around the stadium, and, and West Ness is one example of that, is not just going to be this asset for games, to, or for the Falcons 10 times a year, or for United and the other, for soccer matches. It is how do we leverage it as a community asset and hiring, procurement, and all these different things. And uh, the session earlier about anchor institutions, and we'll talk a little bit about how we've tried to use the stadium as an anchor institution. And third, what we can do to lift up the neighborhoods around that. And for us, that really started through a, a very lengthy community benefit process with Westside residents as the stadium deal was getting negotiated and really making sure that anything we do is grounded in that process and the plan that came out of that. And one of the, you know, at a very high level, what we heard from residents was basically what most people in this room, I think, have and take for granted, right? They wanted to feel safe walking down the street. They want to feel good about where their kids go to school, and they wanted to have access to a job that allows them to take care of themselves and their families. And that jobs piece was the number one, two, and three priority we heard through dozens of meetings with the community in terms of where they wanted us to start. And so Arthur made a public commitment to say, we will hire Westside residents to help build the stadium and then operate it. And as a function of that commitment, as a function of his belief in the foundation's belief in the dignity of work, and as a function of what Eddie just and Damon just laid out in terms of the importance of having a job as an anchor for community revitalization, helping to lift your family up, as well as community retention, that is one of the first places we started and we launched Westside Works, which is this workforce development center a little over three years ago. And Westside Works is really focused on three basic things. First, how do we help residents get a job? Second, once they have it, how do we help them keep it? And then third, how do we over time create pathways to better jobs, pathways to greater self-sufficiency and financial stability? So that was our basic premise, our, our goal. And over the last three years, we've bit by bit have been building towards that. And so at Westside Works, we provide a, an array of different types of programs, a lot of soft skill training as well as hard skill training. The hard skill training really started with, because we were building the stadium, construction program, the culinary arts program you just saw, IT, healthcare, and most recently we just added childcare. Child Development Associate Training Program. And over these three years, we've registered four to 5,000 people at Westside Works and have been able to place, as of, I think, two months ago, 451 residents in living wage jobs in these different industries. And you can see construction is a big part of that. And importantly to me is those residents who've kept their jobs, which you see there, 82% retention rate after one year, which when you compare that to a lot of other places, is closer to 50 to 60 percent, these folks have earned over 12 million dollars in wages for themselves and their families. So for us, th that is a good start. And really over these first three years where we've been focused is really the first two, helping folks get a job, helping them keep it, and now really thinking about how do we create those pathways to better jobs. Um, they asked us to give you kind of what we think has, been, has helped make this model successful and then what our challenges have been. So for, from my perspective, from what we've seen is, one, we had great partners. This is a program of the foundation, but we have partners who make this happen. We have both community-based partners as well as external partners. And that's something I think is really important to highlight and surface because when you do these place-based initiatives, because we're part of a, a broader place-based initiative and this is just one part of it, you have to strike an appropriate balance between really lifting up groups that are from the community and, and helping to increase their capacity and their bandwidth, while at the same time bringing in outside expertise and experience. If you don't strike a good balance, it's not going to work. So part of what has made Westside Works work is that we have great partners from both within and without the community. Second is a really strong focus on not just the resident, but on the employer. A lot of times, workforce development organizations get the resident part really well, but they don't pay adequate attention to the employer. And so you get trained, but then you don't get placed. You know, one of the great things we've been able to do, especially with the construction 
program, and now more so with the others, is develop solid partnerships with employers. For us, we had the added advantage we were a project owner, a very large $1.5 billion stadium. Um, but we had a partner who had relationships in that industry. And so within construction, for example, we had the Construction Education Foundation of Georgia, the, the statewide association of commercial construction firms. And we created a consortium. So it started with a couple dozen construction employers, now grown to over 150 employers, who not every single hiring fair we had, but a, a good chunk of construction firms would come every time we had a hiring fair. And in construction, we've gotten now through 22 training cohorts. 21 of the 22 cohorts have had 100% placement the, the day of graduation mm. because we have the employers at the table. They develop the curriculum. They put their stamp on it. We, they, you know, they, it's their association we're partnering with, so they trust it. So that is something that I think is really key. We, we're now bringing that to culinary, healthcare, and so on. So that's something I think I would put out there. A second is the sectoral approach to workforce development, where you really need to think about how you form partnerships with industries. So for us, I've talked about partnering with uh, SEFCA and, and creating a consortium there. Another key thing is we, we've worked with the Georgia Restaurant Association, with the Hospitality Association, to think through, again, well, who are those employers that are going to be hiring on a regular basis? And what are their needs? And making sure that your curriculum speaks to that and that you're addressing the soft skill needs, the hard skill needs that they are looking for when they're hiring folks. A third would be is really understanding where folks are at and meeting them where they're at. So, for example, when we first started, a lot of, a lot of people were telling us that the big challenge we would run into well, is, is you know, people would fail drug tests and criminal background and this and that. And what we've come to find is those aren't really our issues. You know, do, folks, do some folks fail a drug test? Sure, but not that many. And we give them a second chance, right? Do folks have criminal background? Yes. However, part of what you need to do as folks who are working in community is how do you push on the employers to be flexible? So one of the first things I remember doing is going to speak before the construction consortium and saying, hey, we need you all to be more flexible around your hiring practices. Because you know, of those 301 folks who have been in place, 80% of them have a criminal background. 60 of that 80 have a felony background. But construction is an industry that has lower barriers to entry with respect to that. And we push the employers. And we're doing that in all the industries. So kind of understanding where folks are at and how do you help push that. Another thing that we saw that we didn't anticipate when we first started was all these programs have a minimum literacy and numeracy threshold of sixth grade, except for IT, which has 10th grade, which makes it a lot harder. And why is that harder is because we've, you know, the, the TABE is a widely used literacy and numeracy test. We've TABED over 4,000 people. 50% of those folks who, who uh, take the TABE do not meet sixth grade threshold. And so we didn't know that before we started. And so one of the things we immediately figured out within a few months is like, okay, we need to bring in some very targeted literacy support because a lot of people were at like fourth and fifth grade. And some of that is just getting refresher. And so we provided some targeted literacy support with one of our, our partners in Atlanta, Literacy Action. So to us, that's really just about how do you, you know, really understand where folks, you know, what those challenges are and be able to respond pretty quickly and be able to iterate because while we, you know, going in, we thought we had a decent handle on what the challenges would be. We didn't have a perfect handle. And so we, we needed to just know that, go do, do that with our eyes wide open and be ready to, to move and course correct as we, as we did. Um, in terms of what our challenges have been, I think the, the biggest one, or, or, or there's a few I would say, one, and this is not just for workforce, this has been true in crime and safety, health, economic inclusion, all the other activities, is building trust and credibility with residents. Because I, I don't know how many folks, whether funders or nonprofits who come in from the outside, is like, well, they need this. We're going to show up and there's, there's going to be a line out the door. And there's no one. And people were like, they don't understand why it is. The folks need this. Is it, how do you make it accessible and credible to, to people in the community. 
How do you build that trust? How do you bring in partners who have that trust? That's part of why it's so important to have neighborhood-based groups be part of your consortium. So that's something that I think is really, really critical to make sure as, as you do this work is you, you, you really are mindful of how you build trust and credibility. Another one that has been significant beyond the literacy is really just transportation and just being thoughtful about how you think about transportation. We did an analysis of the 18% the, the who weren't able to keep their jobs and, did, and check back with them and their employers to really understand well, what was, you know, why did they lose their job. Some of it, they did things they shouldn't have done, right? But the most cited reason was transportation. And so how do we respond to that? Because we're all in different cities that some are transit rich, some are not. Atlanta is a big sprawling metro and some jobs are on the MARTA line, the transit line, some are not. So how do we create a, a path towards a long-term transportation solution? And so for us, we've, you know, we've just launched an Uber pilot with some of our partners to think through, okay, during training and maybe right afterwards, here's a, a, t a transitional measure that hopefully buys us time to think through what's their long-term transit option. So with that, I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you so much, man. Give a round of applause to both of them. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, it's exciting because I think the ability to actually provide people these tools, but thinking through what does it take besides having the tools right. to make sure that they're successful and wrap around them a thoughtful process that uh, really allows you to know that you've made sure there's a path for people to be successful that's uh, measurable at the most important level, which is at their family income and opportunity level, uh, which can be missed sometimes. I think for a lot of efforts like ours, we can be doing a lot of great things in these neighborhoods, but at, if at the per family and the household per capita level, you don't find yourself uh, witnessing financial transformation, we're still dealing with people who are stuck in poverty in many ways. So for folks listening to you that are either doing something similar or contemplating trying to really tackle this um, in their neighborhood work, what would you say has been the number one, if you had to kind of put a hierarchy to a key lesson thus far that you wish somebody would have told you when you started uh, doing this, what, what's been a number one lesson or idea that you want to pass on? I would say when working with the specific populations we're talking about is really understanding the wraparound services like you, were ta like you mentioned and also the opportunities in the community. So we'll have um, single mothers, we'll take care of all the tuition or find a way for them to have it taken care of. But if they don't have childcare or um, other uh, barriers yeah. addressed, then they can't get through the training. So really making sure those are addressed is important. Yeah, that's really good. Mm -hmm. Frank, what would you say? Um, yes. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of it, maybe it's, this may be Atlanta, I don't know, the different communities, is just really having a good handle on all the politics that you have to kind of deal with, and, uh, politics up and down the chain, right? And so, mm. um, for example, you know, we've, you know, in Atlanta, our workforce development agency has had a checkered history, I'll just say that. Yeah. Um, and we've partnered with them, and then we don't, and then we partner with them, and then we don't. Um, and I think it's, at the end of the day, for to build a sustainable workforce development system over time, you really need to f think through, and you can't do it by yourselves, but with partners, how you make sure all the different important pieces are part of the, the whole puzzle, um, and just build that into your process. Because yeah. um, that is, you, yeah. That is a big challenge. Yeah, so it's funny. I think it's, there's something to, I love there are a couple of things that each of you have said when it comes to putting these pieces in order. It's easy to kind of, oh, I've got this great program. They're going to be fantastic. We're going to do this. People need this. Let's show up. And mm -hmm. nobody shows up. Because you, you haven't, it's not the program you need to sell. It's whether you're trustworthy. Uh, to them and figuring out how to build that trust so that people want to show up to anything that you offer. And then even then, there's a balance between people wanting something uh, beyond just needing it uh, and then being thoughtful about, yeah, there are things that are obvious people need. How can you think about that in advance to sort of lay the groundwork so that they have a track to run on without some of the typical hurdles that are there? Uh, I know for me, sometimes it's helpful when I'm learning from people that are further ahead in doing something is to not only ask what they did right and what they figured out, but what, what are some of the mistakes or lessons learned uh, because of challenges or landmines stepped on was a few years ago, uh, John Majors is in the room at a purpose-built communities. It was like our third trip up, taking either partners or board members. And I finally had to say, look, okay, obviously we love you guys at Purpose Built. We think this is awesome. We've drunk the Kool-Aid. Uh, we're on board. But um, there's got to be something you've done wrong. There's got to be something that where you've made a mistake that we could learn from 
in order to adjust. And we talked then about really thinking beyond the single project to the transformation of the whole neighborhood and to land acquisition and control beyond the boundaries of that physical real estate property you first get a hold of. For you guys, in this work, um, is there, was there a moment where you're like, oh, had I, had I known better, we probably would have done this differently or totally stepped into something here that I, would, <laughs> I wish no one else uh, went through? Is there a lesson learned from a mistake in the process that you'd like to pass on uh, to others? Would you like to take that one first? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay. So, you know, there are a lot of mistakes. Yes. Um, I think for us, or I'll just say for me, I remember I, I moved to Atlanta for this, this role three and a half years ago, and I started in February, and then like in mid-March, early April, I was told we needed to open up a workforce development center in two months. And so, okay, um, so we, we were basically building the plane as it took off mm -hmm. uh, kind of phenomena, and so there are, I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, that's one, <laughs> yeah. if you can avoid it, that was not yeah. in, an intentional thing. Um, I think to me the big lesson learned from that or just kind of thing that it drove home for me is that you have to be flexible because you think you know what's going to happen, but most of the time you don't. And, you know, I, I've been doing community development for a long time and I've done a lot of different kind of programming. Uh, but, and I had my, my own suspicions about, okay, this is what I think is going to end up happening. And you get you know, more than half of it, right? But a lot of it you don't. Um, so you have to build that flexibility into your process and into your system to allow you to course correct quickly and iterate with the community and with your partners to, to make things work. Because if you don't, then you're, if you're kind of rigid or if you're, you know, for example, and this was true for Westside Works and all of our partners, you know, from a foundation hat, separate from the program hat, we didn't make any long-term invest. We made one-year investments on all our partners because we really had no clue as to what was, you know, whether that program's gonna work or not, or that was the right partner. And we said, look, we're gonna engage with you on a regular basis, because this is a little different than most foundations in that our own, our founder is gonna be held accountable for the success of this initiative. So we ha he, you know, he's charged us with being very engaged. So we're, we're kind of serving as a partial community quarterback in certain respects. Um, so we, ha we had to do that. Um, and then now over time, we've been able to, with some of our partners, do longer term investments, three year grants, when we first started, we weren't doing any of that. Yeah. Um, so that's maybe a, a, a lesson for, for some of the, uh, the funders in the room. Yeah, thank you, that's really good. Shana, what would you say? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> that's a good one. What, what was the question again? <laughs> like, what was the hardest <laughs> thing? Mistake you've learned. Miss yeah, mistake, okay. Um, let's see, so I would probably never start a company again without knowing my co-founders. I did that when I started this school. Uh, four years ago. Mm. I wouldn't change a thing. It was the best thing I've done for my career, but I would not recommend that. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, really good experience that way. One thing that I do like, though, and to your point about being able to course correct quickly and the importance of that, especially when you're small and basically a startup, mm. um, is that we had, our classes were so short, so they were 10 weeks long. So when something didn't work, we figured it out really quickly. So one thing we kept doing was trying to run classes based on new technology that no one was hiring for because we thought it was cool. And I was like, you know, um, we can't do cool stuff. It has to be revenue generating. So we <laughs> went back to the community and said, what are you actually hiring for? Like if I'm a junior person in tech, no prior experience, what is the best opportunity for me to get in? And it's help desk, it's QA, it's like junior front end developer type of role. So we started teaching that and it wasn't sexy or cool, but that's where our students were able to um, you know, get the most out of the training with us. So I would say um, that that's something we learned is that we don't always have to do the coolest thing. We can teach that stuff as a supplement to yeah. our core, but um, you, know, you don't have to be cool. I do think that um, also up front, we did not do a great job of, of creating partnerships, but then mm -hmm. learned very quickly that that was going to be an important part to our success. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah, both of you are so helpful in these responses. Um, if I had to ask you, is there a particular way in which the community surprised you? Uh, a, a resident or the, the group of folks you were working with either exceeded your expectations or hit you with a curveball? Uh, because I think a lot of times that's the stuff you don't and can't plan for. Like you go in with these great uh, visions about what this program's going to do and how it's going to help people, and you've done a great job talking to folks and engaging them, but then when the rubber hits the road, uh, there are all kinds of speed bumps that you could not have seen coming. 
Uh, and so I'm curious if either of you have had surprises on the neighborhood relations side of things or just in interacting with students in the program, mm -hmm. uh, be it a challenge or uh, someone exceeding expectations somehow, uh, a surprise that you've run into in the work with folks. Hmm. Okay, I got it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I think the, the 18 to 24 population that we've been talking about, that is a really challenging group to connect with for mm -hmm. us anyway. Um, and so I've realized that some of our best, our best folks to go out and talk to these young people are other graduates who are their yeah. same age. So it's not Shauna Dorsey go out and talk to them. I just can't relate to mm -hmm. that age group as well anymore. Um, but yeah, having some of our graduates has really helped. It takes maturity to start acknowledging that. <laughs> yeah, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the thing, I don't know if it's so much surprising as it is validating, is you, you get these narratives out there that folks on the west side, they don't want, you know, they're not looking for work or, you know, this mm -hmm. or that. And then you, you see some of the, some of the things th these folks would go through, go through training program. You know, I remember when we first started the construction program, for example, you know, we had folks, you know, a couple guys who were sleeping in the park across mm -hmm. the street that was, they were going through training. And they were just that, they were that committed because they, they needed to break that cycle for themselves mm -hmm. and their families. Or I remember this one guy, Ian, Ian Miller, who got featured in a big Coca-Cola commercial um, like two years back, he had been in jail for 10 years for, for murder. Mm -hmm. And he had gotten out, he, was in a, he came straight from the halfway house into the program, went to work for the joint venture team that, helped, that managed the stadium project and now makes $70,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, over a two-year time frame, street going from jail, and there's a lot, you know, and we know this. There's a lot of different ways to get kicked off that path because one of the things is this. You know, we see, we see this very clearly. This is not this linear thing. Like once you get a job, it's all rainbows and unicorns, right? right. Mm. It is. If, you know, people fall off the track, they go back, and what can we do to help kind of support them on that journey so that they stay on that track over time? Uh, so to me, that's been you know, that's the impressive thing. Given all the challenges that, f that folks are just dealing with on a day in, day out basis, mm -hmm. their commitment to going through that uh, and wanting to you know, change that narrative for themselves. Yeah, I think too, just to supplement that, I've had a couple of folks who, who have had such challenging backgrounds and so they come to interfaces like, look, I'm really ready to turn things around to your point. So like you'll have, uh, we had a single dad who had four really young kids and he was a painter and just, uh, you know, had a lot of side jobs to kind of support his family and finally said, this is it, I'm at kind of rock bottom and this is the hardest point in my life, I'll take an interface course. And he would bring his kids to the school, we actually had space for them to kind of hang out and they weren't too distracting or anything, um, but he was doing whatever it took to make that work. We've had um, a guy who was in prison for a while too who ended up going through our class and also someone who was homeless prior to going to interface. So um, he drove three or four hours to come to a one hour info session to meet us to see if we were legit or not. And um, he decided to take the course. Um, he actually ended up teaching one of the high school classes for 75 North last summer and has had a really successful career, brought his own car, like things to mm. that many of us take mm. for granted, but um, it's just incredible to see people really commit themselves. So we do part of the work, which is provide the opportunity. But then it's up to these individuals to really take ownership of that. And that part can be hard sometimes to not put yourself um, in a space where you feel like it's your responsibility to make sure they're successful. Like we do have that responsibility, but ultimately um, to see these GDP growth rate for uh, finding in our own communities in our most uninvested areas, uh, untapped assets for tremendous economic growth. Uh, a friend of mine who's pretty successful as an investor likes to say that his, uh, his core strategy is to invest in undervalued assets. <laughs> uh, so things that others discount, that others think don't have a future, are not worth putting a penny in, uh, you find the right ones and you double down uh, on those investments at the right time. And I think to really look at our communities where we have people that are um, underinvested in and investing in them enough to turn them into really, really valuable uh, assets and contributors in our community. I'm so grateful for you two as examples of that. Give them a round of applause, please. We have a mic in the center of the room. We'd like to invite people to bring up questions uh, or thoughts about what you've heard thus far. Yeah. Good morning, Jeff with Lift Orlando. Uh, thanks for the conversation. Uh, I'm curious about, if, with the risk of boring the rest of the room, if you could talk a little more specifically about the 300 employees of the construction project mm -hmm. and what that looked like for you as the owner of the group 
to sort of uh, weigh in on those decisions for hiring with your with your subs and your general. Sure. So um, one, of, yeah, one of the things I had meant to mention earlier that I think is important, and we had the advantage we're the product owner, but is forming strategic partnerships with anchor institutions. It got alluded to um, oh, earlier yeah. t uh, today, and typically that's people think of hospitals, they think of you know, universities, and more and more starting to think of stadiums. And so for us, it was really about, as product owner, telling, you know, starting with the, you know, the joint venture team that was the GC for the project and saying, it is a priority for you all and all the subs to hire folks graduating from this program. Now, did we say you have to hire 100%? Make, we didn't do that because there has to be that mutual accountability in terms of we're, we, you know, we're working with the consortium, providing a you know, the good curriculum. The folks are going through it. If you graduate from this program, you're going to be a good candidate, and you're going to perform better than your, the typical person who they hire that walks in off the street. And that's proven to be the case, and so we, you know, that made it easy for us. So of that 300 number, only 160 went through Westside Works uh, that got employed by firms uh, that helped build the stadium. The, the rest wor worked for other companies that didn't have anything to do with the project, that just bought into the program. Um, so, so, so to me, you know, to that point, I think a key part is that mutual accountability. You have to have, again, that focus on the employer, what they're looking for and meets their needs, and then getting the, you know, the resident wants a job and getting them ready, he or she ready, to take advantage of that opportunity. Very good. Thank you. Yes. Good morning. I have a question about, you said that you had 4,000 to come through uh, Westside Works, mm -hmm. um, but you employed about 400. So that's about 90% that it didn't work for. Can you speak to some of the tools that you've given them to, um, to work, even though they didn't, didn't go through your program? Sure. So that's the whole, I don't, and we experience it in lots of different programs, this whole funnel effect that happens, right? So you have folks who will register, right? And that, that gets you that four to 5,000. And then you have folks who come to the orientation. And typically, a lot of times, you lose a good chunk of folks who they'll sign up, but then they, don't, they won't come. We have Wednesdays at 10 a.m. every week, that orientation. We'll lose folks there. And we can talk about what happens to that. And then the next one is, okay, you do intake assessments. You take your tape. You, you will we'll sit down and walk with, through with you that and then we lose more folks there. And so at different points in that funnel, we, we lose big, be honest, those first two layers are where we lose yeah. the most people. And so a big part of what we've tried to do is, okay, we gotta increase our hit rate, right, in terms of how, what's going on, right? Because in the first few years, we've been able to capture all those folks who were un unemployed and underemployed who were hungry and had enough of their, you know, act together where they were ready for it, right? But we know there are a lot of folks who they need a job but they also have childcare issues. They may have a mental health issue with their son or their daughter, or they have a parent they're having to deal with, or they have their own behavioral health challenges. And so that's the harder work. Okay, how do we make sure you're fully getting address, all the issues addressed so you can be ready to go, go for that job and make sure all these other things are taken care of? Um, I think for, for us, part of what the next layer has been is so we have this workforce development program, but we have also have partnerships with the, you know, the At Promise Youth Center. We have you know, Families First. We have all these different partners that are physically located in the neighborhood that provide different services, and we're focused on this whole idea of coordination, integration, and thinking through how do we ensure there's no wrong, basically it's a no wrong door initiative. So it doesn't matter which door you come in through, but we're gonna make sure you get connected to the right services so that you can take advantage of them. Okay. Great question, yes. Hi, I'm Anicia Howard from the city of Norfolk, Virginia. And a question for both the panelists is, how did you work through, um, you, you referenced this a little bit in your presentation, but I'm curious to hear from both of you, working with the existing like workforce investment boards, how was that working with them when sometimes you want to focus on a specific area or neighborhood and their funds are set up to work with a particular region? Um, in, in my case in Omaha, I um, serve on our local board. It's uh, Heartland Workforce Solutions. And so I serve on their, their main executive board and then also on the youth council. So really supportive of all their different initiatives. But then making sure that I am a voice at the table for initiatives like 75 North and making sure those are being moved forward. Um, so it's like playing a game a little bit where you're making sure to support all the things, but then yeah. trying to move your mission forward at the same time. So that's what, what I've done here. And for us, yeah, it's been, you know, as I said, it's been a challenge. We've 
you know, we have the advantage of being a foundation, so we've funded the majority, the vast majority of the programming, but we've also built over time this partnership with the workforce board so that they have provided funding. You know, I think a couple hundred thousand, half a million dollars a year towards the, the, all the activities. But that is, that, that is this whole thing. It's ebbed and flowed, depending to your point. They have to, you know, they have to spread the money around all the city of Atlanta. They don't want to just focus, say, on construction or IT. They want to go somewhere else. And so we have to think through, okay, how do we, how do we knit together these different funding sources to make this happen? So you know, for us, for example, we're very focused on bringing additional resources to Westside Works because we're the, the primary funder of it. And we'll continue funding it, but we want it to grow and that means bringing additional resources because we are we're investing in a lot of other areas uh, in addition to workforce. So there's no easy answer is the short of it, I guess. A quick question for you. Um, the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, is that, um, is that a federal, do you know? Is that something that you have access to in your community? Um, okay, yeah. So that's just knowing there's all of these different types of funding sources to your point and, um, you know, once it's also helping people determine if they're eligible, that's another has been a challenge for us at times. Um, but I think the, the closer relationships you have with people on those boards, the better connections you can make for people that might be able to go through any program you have to, so, yeah. Ginny from Grand Rapids. Shauna, in your opening remarks, you mentioned uh, that coding isn't for everybody. That was a lesson learned, and you were gonna expand on that. Yeah. I'd like to just know, what, what have you learned about that, and what's your screening process like? Um, yeah, thank you. So our screening process, it's yeah, an initial application and then we send out an assessment that asks questions that we don't pe expect people to know the answers to. For example, we'll ask them to um, <laughs> write a short program using JavaScript to tell us how to output a phone number um, and make sure that if the, they don't put enough characters in that they get an, an error code, you know, different things like that. Um, that takes a bit of research. And we don't expect them to get it 100% right, but we're interested in their problem-solving skills mm -hmm. and and um, how how much work they're willing to put into something like coding because it's a difficult thing to do. It's not easy to learn. Um, the point I made about tech or coding not being for everyone is really important because I think that people see it as like this silver bullet um, kind of solution to some of these economic issues we're experiencing, but. We know that it isn't for everyone, but just being with AIM Institute, for example, and being able to provide different pathways for people. So it's like, you might love tech, um, but maybe there's a way for you to support it through becoming a tester or a quality assurance type of professional versus a, a uh, programmer. So um, that's kind of what I meant. I hope that answers your question, but um, I just, I'd love to say, we know it, I know it's not for everyone, so I'll never say um, that a coding school is the, the way to fix all the things, you know, so. Yeah, and I would add to that, because, you know, we've had, to that point, mm -hmm. the challenges with the IT program in that we just don't have enough folks who meet the threshold. Right. And we're, we're scouring and, and working with our partner, Prescolis, on it, but it's really, really hard. And so right. one of the things that, that surfaced for us is that you really need to think through, you know, both sides of the equation, right? One, where where are folks at mm -hmm. in terms of where their skill sets are at now and how you can grow that over time. And some of that is a function of systemic stuff that you can't control. So you think about, for us, Atlanta Public Schools, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the stat I said earlier, 50% of folks aren't at sixth grade. 70% of those who did not meet sixth grade had a GED or higher. So what that says is you have a, or historically have had a broken public school system. Mm -hmm. And so we gotta, you got to understand where folks are at. And how do you help them get so that they can be qualified for that job or other kind of jobs that are, will pay more? And on the other side is just thinking through and understanding to balance that in your, in your community, whether it's your neighborhood, your city, or your region, where, are, where is the job growth happening and mm -hmm. what kinds of sectors? Mm -hmm. And how do you, where is that mat, what does that match look like? That's, I think, a critical thing that you, that you have to do for, to, for this to be successful. Right. And one more thing I'll add to that is that there is... Um, another issue which is lack of awareness of what these careers even are and so um, one thing that we're that we've started to look into is um, kind of pre-interface training basically like digital literacy number one so there's folks that don't even have sometimes a basic understanding of basic computer skills so we're looking into that and then just preparation and uh, career aware awareness and exploration so maybe not a full 10 week but you go to a three hour or one day long 
deal to see if it's something you in, might enjoy, and then um, invite them to apply to the program after that. So that there's different ways for people to, to determine if it's a good fit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, a couple more questions. Again. So on the coding front, um, have you, is Atlanta now moving, or you're in Omaha? Omaha, yeah. Has this region moved to, because typically with coding, the bar to entry is a bachelor's degree. Yeah. Um, but are you finding there's a movement now that they want to do kind of 12 or 12 week or 16 week training programs around coding at all? Yes, I am, and I'm, it's really interesting that I didn't bring that up as a challenge because um, that has been a huge barrier for some of our graduates who don't have a college degree. When they're like, "We have, I have the certificate from uh, this code school. Um, when we first started, companies were like, so what? Hmm. You know, um, so it took, it was really important for us to find um, our anchor company, which ended up being First National Bank of Omaha. So in our very first year, they said, we will support this if you teach this specific language. Um, it was a 10-week class. We had candidates come in that did not have bachelor's degrees, but they agreed to give them an, an opportunity you know, to um, evaluate them as candidates. So anyhow, after that experience, and when we were able to say, First National Bank agreed to do this. Here's, here were the outcomes. They hired people. Those people still have jobs today in 2017. Um, other companies started to get on board. So it was really just finding that first partner and a major partner, like First National Bank is the largest privately held bank in the country. And so having them as a partner really made a difference for us um, because of course we'll say it works. We're, we're salespeople at the end of the day, that's how we're viewed. Um, but when you have that, that CIO of a major company mm -hmm. in town say, we believe in this and we're going to invest our resources in this, then that made a big difference. Yeah, so big yeah, we're starting to see the switch, but I will say too that the startups and smaller companies are typically l more flexible on that degree requirement. Um, we still have some large old firms that will not consider you as a candidate if you do not have a bachelor's degree still, but we're continuing to fight that battle here. So, but slow change. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions to wrap up? Join me in thanking these wonderful panelists. We're so grateful for the work that you're doing. What a great example to all of us. Thank you.